Welcome, lovely listeners, to two old time radio episodes. Your theme today is Murderers with a Twist. Your first tale is The Defense Rests. What does a lawyer and a criminal have in common? Well, in this case, a lot more than you think. So much more than one would first assume. And your next tale, White Rose Murderer, sees a killer leaving a white rose at every murder scene. The murderer has a type. And the love and fortitude of two people worlds apart are tested by this case. Folks, these two stories were a labor of love. I mean, all of my old time radio remasters are a labor of love, but this episode in particular had me diving deep into the audio, stripping out clicks, pops, and in some cases, lines were repeated three or four times during the recordings. I can only think that the tape skipped during recordings, creating a set of duplicate recordings. So with a lot of my new work on this one, it may be a little on the rougher side, but I still hope you enjoy it, mates. A huge thank you, of course, to my three white tea warlords, Matthew J. Bauer, Maya, and Divided by Zero, the superstars that are the nitros in my podcast car. Thank you so much for your support. Also, a big shout out to all of you listeners over the last week that emailed me. Thank you, and I'll be getting back to you this week, rest assured. And of course, my Earl Grain forces, Chad Warren, Just Heather, Lee Bauer, Lorraine Crisanto, Mace Joe, Paige Marcini, and Peter Raffaelli keeping the lights powered on and the energy pumping through this podcast. Cheers, mates. So turn the lights off, the sound up, and get ready for some deceptively devilish murder mysteries. And now with the defense rests, and with the performance of our star, Alan Ladd, as defendant Robert Tasker, supported by John McIntyre as the noted criminal lawyer, Max Krager, we again hope to keep you in suspense. The People versus Robert Tasker. The defendant charged on the indictment with murder in the first degree. Is counsel for the defense prepared to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Very well, Mr. Crager. Your Honor, if the court please, I think it is fitting that for a moment I should speak openly to Your Honor and to the jury of a matter which has, albeit indirectly, nonetheless a substantial bearing on this case. I refer, of course, to the rather unique relationship existing between myself and the defendant, Robert Tasker. It's true that my interest in him and in his fate is far greater than the normal interest of a lawyer and his client. It's true that that interest might be reasonably described, as it has been so many times, as fatherly. Yet I ask your honor and the gentlemen of the jury to think of me in all fairness and without bias simply as a lawyer defending his client. It needs no expatiation on legal or practical ethics to demonstrate that if I did not believe what my whole heart and mind be. My name is Robert Tasker. I am sitting in a courtroom on trial for murder. As Mr. Craig my lawyer stands there now telling the judge and the jury about me and about him... I can't help thinking that if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. And thinking what irony it is, too. Because Mr. Krager is the only friend I've ever had in the world. I am an ex-con. My sentence was for ten years. After I'd been there about a year, I began to write just short stories, little things. <laughs> I had lots of time. Finally, I sent one to a magazine, and they published it. Mr. Craig, happened to read it. He wrote to me. Then he came to see me. He remembered my case. He said he'd try to help me. Then one day, I was called to the warden's office. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mr. Craig. Robert, I've got some good news for you. I've got your parole. 
You're free. Well, you happy? Sure, it's just that I still don't quite believe it. Mm, it's official, Tasker. Here are your papers. Papers? That'll make everything easy, won't it? Passport to a brilliant future. Ex-con. Robert, I know it's going to be a little hard to adjust at first, but there's a job in my office that I... Thanks, Mr. Craig, but I don't want charity even from you. It isn't charity, Robert. I need a clerk in my office or I wouldn't have offered you the job. You don't have to stay if you don't want to, but you'll be doing me a favor if you try it. Well, I guess I owe you at least one favor. No, yeah, that's you. Goodbye. Good luck. Just remember that what's happened up here is water over the dam. Don't hold any grudges. I don't hold any grudges. There's one man I hate, that's all. A man you hate, Rob? What's the use of kidding about it? His name is Arthur Hines, and I hate him. Simple as that. Well, forget it, son. Hines was D.A. Then he was doing a job, that's all. He had nothing against you. He was doing a job, all right. Robert, you mustn't feel that way. You can get along with Hines, all right? Get along with him? In the office. Oh, uh, didn't I tell you? Arthur Hines is my new partner. <laughs> It certainly threw me for a second to hear I was going to be working side by side with that. But, well, I figured they were right, and I shouldn't hold grudges, and I made up my mind to play ball. The work wasn't hard, and I was able to do some writing on the side. Mr. Crager always encouraged me in that. And Peggy helped me a lot, too. She helped me to believe in myself. All that time, I never saw Mr. Hines. He was out of town or something. And then one day, he came back. I was nervous at the idea of seeing him, but I thought I was all over my resentment then. He was in his office with someone. He'd come in the private entrance. I was out in the anteroom with Peggy by the switchboard when I heard the commotion. No, don't have any English language. No, you're a liar. Now you get out of here. Get out. Don't give me that, Hines. You be the it or you know who has. I don't know anything about it and I don't want to know. Don't you think I got enough trouble nowadays keeping mugs like you out of the pen without being the fence for what you stole? Now, you get out of my office and stay out. Okay, but I'll be back. $50,000 is a lot of money. Huh. What do you want? Why, I... Robert works here, Mr. Hines. My name's Robert Tasker. Did Mr. Craigert tell you about me? I knew I'd seen you before. You're that punk kid I sent up to San Quentin. What's for 10 years? What do you mean you're working here? Well, Mr. Craigert got me out. He gave me a job. Job of what? Snooping outside my office? Oh, I wasn't... Don't talk back to me, you dirty little jail rat. You... Why, you... Robert, what? don't. Let me go. Well, what's the trouble here? Robert. Let me go. Stop it. Calm down. Calm down. What? What's the matter? What's the idea of bringing this kid into the office, Max? Isn't it bad enough to have to work with criminals all day without... Robert's parents? not a criminal. He's here because I want him to be here. Because I believe in him and trust him. Oh, Yeah. You don't still have anything against Robert, do you? I just don't like anybody hanging around outside my door when I'm having a private conference, that's all. All right, all right. Now, look. Robert Tasker is one of the finest, most gifted young people I've ever known. I want him to get along here. And I want him to get along with you, too, Arthur. See? Uh, me, I can get along with anybody. Well, i got to be in court. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, shake hands, both of you, will you? Well, anything to keep peace in the family. That's fine. Everything forgotten. Start off on a clean slate, right? Sure. Well, I'll see you later in the afternoon, Mike. Oh, uh, Robert, come into my office for a minute, will you? Sure. My boy, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know how to begin to apologize. <laughs> Why should you apologize? Oh, it was all my fault. I don't know how I could have been stupid enough not to tell him beforehand for both your sakes. I know, but I just don't like him, and he doesn't like me. No, Robert, you're wrong there. It's just that things have been happening lately to upset him, like this fellow Marvin and his $50,000. You know about that? Well, Robert, you know we have to deal with some peculiar people in this business. There's a poor fellow who's been in prison himself for the last five years. He had quite a lot of money when he went in. Oh, he stole it, I guess. Oh, he thinks Hines hijacked it on him, huh? If he ever really had it. He says he left it with a pal of his... Later, the pal was killed in a gunfight. Gallucci, you remember the case. Yeah, I remember something about it. Anyway, just before he died, he told somebody he'd left the money with Hines. That's how the story goes. But you know how these things travel on the grapevine. It's all nonsense, of course. That guy meant business just the same. That probably explains the whole thing. Hines is a little scared. <laughs> but don't let it worry you, Robert. You will stay, won't you? Believe me, it's for the best. Well, I've got to trust somebody, I guess. Well, trust me, Robert. I've never given you a bum steer, have I? No. 
Okay. That's the spirit. And any other little troubles, you just bring them to me, see? Thanks. Well, I guess I'd better relieve Peggy on the board. Keep your chin up, kid. Sure. Sorry I kept you waiting, Peggy. That's all right. Hey, Peggy, what's the matter? Shh. Please, don't say anything. But Peggy, what is it? Robert, I'm scared. Of what, Hines? Don't be silly. No, no, it's not him. Well, what is it? Robert, I shouldn't, but I've got to tell someone. Well, sure you have. Come on, take it easy now. What is it? Well, I've never told anyone before. Neither Mr. Hines nor Mr. Crager know. I'd die if they did. You wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Of course I won't. Come on, come on, spill it. You saw that man who was in here, who was arguing with Mr. Hines about the $50,000? Yeah. Well, it's true. There is $50,000 somewhere. Yeah? Well, how do you know all this? I know, and I'm scared. Robert, he's a killer. That guy? Well, I wouldn't be surprised, but how do you know? Because he's my own brother. I had a hunch to lamb out of there right then. I knew something was going to happen. But I hated to run out on Peggy when she was in jam and might need help. And I didn't want to let Mr. Crager down either. So I stayed. Then one day, about two weeks later, it came. I hadn't had any more trouble with Hines. He was out of town most of the time anyway. He was still out of town that day. The day that... that he died. Craig and Hines. I'm sorry he's out of town. You might try later this afternoon. Yes, I'll tell Mr. Hines. Say, Peggy. Uh Uh-huh? Do you know when Mr. Craig will be in? No, he didn't say. He's still over in the court. I'm... Harry. Where is he? Who? You know who. Hines. Oh, Harry, I told you not to come. I begged you not to... Sure, sure. Always a little pal. Always a little... Hey, wait a minute. What does this guy know? I told him that we were... That you were my brother. But nobody else knows him. Yeah, sure. Okay. What do I care? I only care about one thing. Harry, you promised you wouldn't come up here. Where's Hines? I don't know. He's out. Well, then I'll wait till he comes back. Harry, you must... I'm staying. I'll get it out of him. Harry, your sister said you should leave. Keep out of this, punk. I don't like that word, pal. Robert, listen. Will you watch the board for a few minutes? Sure. It's lunchtime anyway. Harry, I've got some things I want to talk over with you, privately. Yeah? What things? About Hines and... You know. Come on, we'll go downstairs to the grill in the lobby. You wouldn't be trying to ease me out of here, would you? No, honest. I, I've got to talk to you, Harry. Come on. Okay, and listen, pal. Yeah? If Mr. Hines comes in, you tell him I was here. And tell him he better come across or else. Is that all? That's enough, isn't it? He'll know what I mean. Plenty. Sure. Craig and Hines. Hello, Robert. This is Max Craig. Oh, yes, Mr. Craig. You there all alone? Peggy out to lunch, huh? Uh, yes, she is. Well, that can't be helped. I'm in a hurry. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Yes, sir? I'm across the street in the courthouse, Judge Andrews' court, the Ellsworth case. Now, there's some notes I've got to have over here right away. They're in my own handwriting in pencil and clearly marked Ellsworth. Yes, sir? You'll find them in Mr. Hines' office. The pages are all clipped together. I, I don't know exactly where in his office. It may be on his desk or maybe one of the drawers or in the files or under the blotter. But keep looking, you see? Keep looking until you find it. All right, sir. Then bring it over to me right away. Got it? Yes, sir. I'll be waiting for you. I left the switchboard, went into Mr. Hines' office. I started looking around for the notes. I looked everywhere. The desk drawers, the filing cabinet. I even tried to look in the safe, but it was locked. Then I noticed some yellow papers on top of the bookcase. I reached up and took them down. I was standing there with my back to the private entrance, looking the papers over to be sure that they were right ones when... What are you doing in here? Mr. Craig wanted some papers, Mr. Hines. I thought I told you to stay away from my office. What are you snooping around in here for? Well, Mr. Craig told me to look in here for... Yeah? There's something mighty funny going on around this office. There's nothing funny, Mr. Mr. Craig just... I say there is. What's that switchboard girl doing sneaking around the lobby with Harry Marvin? Tried to duck me, but I saw him. First the switchboard girl turns out to have a crazy ex-convict for a boyfriend, and That's now... a lie. He's a brother. A brother? Oh, so that's it. I shouldn't have said that, Mr. Hines. I, I don't know anything about no, it. No, really. you don't. I, well, I do. I get it now. I knew there was something. All of a sudden, I get it. Mr. Hines, there's nothing to get. Yeah, so the girl and her brother go down to the lobby and set themselves an alibi because they know I'll suspect them. 
And then they get you to do that dirty work. For a nice fat cut, I suppose. That's what you think. Please, Mr. Hines, don't talk that way. Well, you didn't find it, did you? And you won't. Now get out of here, you little punk, before I... I said don't talk that way. Why, you dirty, thieving little server? I told you not to talk that way. He fell and just lay there. For a minute, I didn't know what to do. And I knew I'd have to tell Mr. Crager... I knew I was all washed up there anyway. I couldn't very well expect even a man like Mr. Craig to choose between his law partner and me. And I couldn't stay in the same office with Mr. Hines after what had happened. But somehow I wanted to tell Mr. Craig myself before anyone else did. I went out to the switchboard and dialed the courthouse number. Judge Andrews Court, Johnson speaking. I want to speak to Mr. Max Craig. This is office calling, please. Well, I don't see him around here right now. The court's in recess. I know, but try to locate him, will you? It's important. Okay. Hold the line. I sat there waiting for them to find Mr. Craig. And all of a sudden, I remember the papers he wanted. I cut off the call on the switchboard. I had to take the papers over to him anyway, and I, I thought I might as well go over and give him the papers and tell him what had happened. Get it over with. I was starting for the front door of the office. Oh, no, no. Then I heard a sound from Mr. Hines' office behind me. At first, I thought he was just coming to, and I kept going. Then something sort of clicked in my mind, and I stopped. The sound hadn't seemed quite right for a man just coming to. I listened, but I didn't hear anything more. And that didn't seem quite natural either. I, I went back and opened the door to Mr. Hines' office. He was lying there just as I'd left him, and... There was something different. I went over and looked at him more closely. His face was a terrible gray. I touched his wrist, feeling for his pulse. The next thing I knew, I was down on my knees, tearing open his collar, but even then I knew it wasn't any use. Mr. Hines was dead. I, I don't know how long I stood there in the room. It might have been hours. It might have been only a couple of minutes. I... I just stood there, my mind dazed, and yet at the same time racing through a thousand half-formed plots and schemes of escape, of what I could say, of some way out of it. And the switchboard began to buzz and incoming call. It sort of brought me to my sense of smart of habit than anything else. I, I went to answer it. Craig and Hines. Robert, you still there? Mr. Craig, I... Where are those notes? Have you found them yet? Yes, I found them all right. Well... Bring him over here. I need him right away. Mr. Craig, I... Robert, what's the matter with you? I... I just killed Mr. Hines. Just making it hard for yourself, Tesker. I've told you what happened. In the pig's eye you have. Well, I don't have to talk if I don't want to. Oh, no? I'm waiting for Mr. Craig. I told you that. Craig, what do you think he's going to do for you? I don't know. Well, I do. He's going to see that you burn. That's what he's going to do for you. Maybe. What do you expect? You kill a man's law partner right in his own office. You think he's going to help you? Are you crazy? Well, he told him he'd come down. Sure, of course he'll come down to give evidence against you. Now, listen, Tasker. Oh, yeah. You give a full confession, we may be able to get you a break. All right. Mr. Krager's outside, Captain. He wants to see you. Sure. Send him in. Okay, Mr. Krager. Thank you. Uh, hi, boys. Hey, Mr. Krager. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mr. Krager. I've been treating you all right? Pretty good. Fine. I don't like to have my people treated roughly. You what? You heard me, Captain. And while you're at it, you might as well take those handcuffs off of him. Because from this moment, he's out on bond, released in my custody. I've got the papers right here. Say, are you crazy? Certainly not. I simply don't believe the boy did it, that's all. Well, I'll be... All right, Hawkshaw. Who do you think did it? That, Captain, is your department. My job is simply to defend an innocent man. Now, look, Craig, don't try to kid us. It's an open and shut case. Task is the only person who had the opportunity... The only one I had a motive. Uh huh. Well, not to speak ill of the deed, Captain, and although Arthur Hines was my law partner, it is unfortunately true that quite a number of people at least thought they had a motive. Sure. So maybe this ex-con Harry Marvin had a motive, or even the dame on the switchboard had a motive, for all I know. But they couldn't have done it. Fifty people saw him together downstairs in the lobby of the building at the time the murder was committed. Oh, you talked to him, have you? Sure. So what? Listen, this kid admits he had a quarrel with Hines. He always hated him anyway. He admits he hit him. So he picks the paperweight off the desk and smashes him over the head. Wait a minute. You didn't say anything about that, Robert? No, I didn't even know about it before. I I didn't hit him with a paperweight. Stop it, will you? The back of the man's head is bashed in with that paperweight. 
This kid's fingerprints are all over. <laughs> What's so funny? This is murder, mister. I'm sorry, but you find out if you ever try to bring this boy to trial for killing Arthur Hines with a paper. Listen, Crager, I know you're pretty smart. I know you go around bragging you never lost a case. And that goes for this one. Double. But you're not going to make a chump out of me. This boy's going to be indicted for murder. He's going to be convicted of murder. And he's going to burn for murder. <laughs> Indicted, convicted, burnt. Three promises. And the first one's already happened. The second one, well, even I can see we don't stand much chance. And the third one, well, I just try not to think about it. There's Mr. Crager up before that jury. Well, you didn't have to lock the door, Robert. I wanted to be private. All right. But, Robert, you mustn't worry like this. Let me do the worrying. They can't convict you if there's a reasonable doubt. That's the law, and there is a reasonable doubt. Somebody did come in and hit Hines in those six or seven minutes. It must have been that way. Yeah, I know. Of course you do. We've been over the whole thing. Now let's go back into that courtroom. Mr. And... Kager, there's something I haven't told you. Something you haven't told me? What? Oh, it's a little thing, but it's kind of important because it's something I never told anyone. Well, what is it? I never told anyone that Peggy was Harry Marvin's sister, except Mr. Hines, by mistake. And he's dead. Now, Robert, don't you think that's a little trivial to be... No, because you know about it. You just said so in the courtroom. Well, I... I... There's only one way you could have found out. You must have been in your office when I had the fight with Hines and heard me tell him. Robert, that's ridiculous. Oh, no, it isn't, because you're right. Somebody did come in in those six or seven minutes and kill Hines. You did. You're crazy. Yes, it must have been for that $50,000 you hijacked the hijacker. And you knew they'd pin it on me with my record. Maybe that's why you got me out of the pen in the first place. It is, isn't it? Well, I'm not going to stay here and listen to any such thing. Oh, yes, you are, because I'm going to get the truth out of you right now. You planned it that way, didn't you? You sent me into Hines' office that day, and you probably sent him. And you figured you were such a hot lawyer that might even get me off with 20 years or so. To ease your dirty conscience, didn't you? Talk, Craig. You won't get anywhere using violence with me. No. Talk. Uh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Even if I did confess, it wouldn't hold up as evidence. Talk. Listen. Listen, no. Listen. We, we, we postponed the trial. If I can get you out of the country, I'll give you money. That's all I wanted to know. Talk. No, don't. No. Don't. You no. You're killing. No, Carter. That's where you were when I told you to start. The guy behind you, weren't you? You were killing Hines, weren't you? No. No. Okay. I guess we can unlock the door now. What's going on? He's crazy. He attacked me. So I gather. He even accused me of murder. Yes, I heard him. Tell me, Crager, where were you when this boy phoned you here at court? When they couldn't find you? Yeah, why? As a matter of fact, I was right here. Right in this very room. I had some work to do. I wanted privacy. Your court was in recess. You were out of town. Yes, I know. But there's something you don't know. Uh, hey, what? On the day of the murder, the floor of this room was being repainted. And the paint, Mr. Crager, was quite wet. Your Honor, the defense rests. And so closes the defense rest starring Alan Ladd. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. Alan Ladd appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of Lady in the Dark. John McIntyre played lawyer Max Krieger. Suspense. This is the man in black. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star this evening is Miss Maureen O'Hara, whom you've seen rise to stardom in Hollywood within the short space of a year. Her performances in the 20th Century Fox production, How Green Was My Valley, then more recently in The Immortal Sergeant, and now currently in the RKO production, This Land Is Mine, have given her an enviable place in the ranks of America's new film favorites. Miss O'Hara makes her first appearance on our suspense stage tonight as the heroine of 
a study in homicidal mania. The White Rose Murders by Cornell Woolrich, which is tonight's tale of suspense. He stood there waiting. He knew that presently they would come out of the second-rate dance hall, out into the dimly lit street. He listened a while and smiled as the orchestra played that tune inside. And then they came out, the two girls. And still he waited, close enough to hear what they were saying. Well, I'll see you at the office tomorrow, Sally. Oh, I don't know how I'll get up. It's after one o'clock. Six hours sleep. Oh, I'll be dead tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Me too. Oh, gosh. I gotta have at least eight hours or I'm no good at all. I wish I had someone to walk me to the bus. It's four long blocks. I'll walk you down, Sally. Oh, don't bother. We go in different directions. Well, it's no trouble. Really, I don't mind. But really, it's not necessary. <laughs> In the narrow alley that divides the dance hall from an ugly office building, he stood smiling. Just a little inside the alley, he stood stiffly against the wall, his head back, eyes closed, arms straight down, hand in his left hand. A white rose. Well, all right then, Sally. Good night. Good night, Joan. See you in the morning. Um, da 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 Oh, I hope I don't have to wait long for the bus. <gasps> Who are you? Keep away. Keep away from me. Let me go. Let me go. The girl is dead. Tenderly, the figure straightens her hair and gently places the limp body on the ground. Then he opens her clenched fist and carefully so that the thorns will not bruise her flesh. He places in her hand the white rosebud. Pardon me, my good man. Is it true that you are the famous detective Terence Riley? Huh? Oh, Jenny, I didn't see you come in. Well, now that I'm here, how about offering to buy a cup of coffee for the girl you're going to marry? You can never get up enough nerve to ask her. Oh, well, it's no use, Jenny. I guess we better call it quits. I'm just a dick on the homicide squad, and that's all I'll ever be. And I'm a rich debutante. We don't belong together. Oh, you've been reading too many of those romantic stories, Terry. What is it this time? What's wrong? Yeah, they call him the White Rose Killer. He's got to be caught. It's a general demotion coming on if he isn't, and that's... All I need to get back into uniform. Oh, don't worry, darling. You always look good in blue. Yeah. Just to match the way I feel. Tell me more about the White Rose Killer. What's he like? That's the stumble. He, he could be anybody. No one's ever seen him except the dead. And they don't talk about it afterward. Just slips out of the shadows and kills and then slips back again. How many has he murdered? Four. And he's not through yet. It's going to be one of those chain things that he's allowed to keep on. Are you sure it's always the same one? Yeah. That part of it we're sure of. The same touch, the same way of operating every time. How do you know that? Well, it's a rose. A white rosebud. Death rose. Puts it into each victim's hand after he kills it. Huh? Yep. It's always a woman. A young woman between 19 and 23. What's behind it? Do you have any idea? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. But here's what I figured out. You know what a rose stands for, symbolically, I mean. Why, yes, it's, uh, it's the flower of love. The white rose, uh, the bud, has another meaning. Purity, loyalty, devotion, and especially it stands for a young girl. That's right. And that's about the way I see it. So maybe it's a double cross, committed against our murderer by some young girl whom he worshipped and who betrayed his faith in her. You ought to be a detective, not me. Thanks, darling. I've got a very fine teacher. Ha <laughs> sweet. There's another thing. The murders were all committed near places where there was music, dance halls and cabarets and the like. There's a song that brings back the original shock that, you know, gives him the final push over into the darkness. As far as we can figure out, it's the beer barrel polka. Well, how does he commit the murder? Is it always the same way? Always. Strangulation between the hands. With a thumb into the windpipe to keep his victims from crying out. 
But isn't there anything else you know about him? No, that's, that's why it's so hopeless. He's insane, of course. But there's only this one phase to his insanity. Probably perfectly normal in appearance and behavior. You can pass him on the street and even know it. Well, it's only when he sees someone vaguely like the girl he loved and hears that song, the one defective wire in him is jangled and short circuit. But Terry, the flowers, don't flowers tell you? He must get them somewhere you could trace. We don't know where he gets them. Maybe he steals them or... Terry, what if you were the one to get him? Well, the mean a citation and a promotion. And then all the things that stand between us would disappear? We could get married? Well, the chances would be a lot better anyway. But what chance have I? Everyone in the department has been working their heads off for weeks and they've all failed. Uh-huh. Uh, Terry, what were the girls like? The ones he killed? Well, as, as I told you, they were all between 19 and 23. Their heights were pretty much the same, too. They're all tall girls, around five feet, six or seven. A little taller than you. And all dark-haired. How did they wear their hair? Why, they... Say, what is this? Oh, nothing, darling. Just, just interested. How did they wear their hair? Well, from what I remember, they uh, were sort of loose and curly down the back. I suppose each one had a resemblance to that long dead love of his. That's probably it. Well, anyway, that's how the record stands. And we're all waiting for it to happen again. I see. Uh, Terry, um, I'd like to go home now. I shouldn't have told you all that stuff. I've given you the creeps. Oh, come on, Terry. Take me home. <laughs> Later, Jenny stands by the window in her room, looking out, thinking. She doesn't move for a long time. Then suddenly, quickly, she goes to her closet and begins to rummage through her many pairs of shoes. Carefully, she picks one pair with three-inch heels. Five foot six or seven. Then she walks quickly to the dresser, opens a drawer takes out a comb and starts redoing her hair. Worn loose and curly down the back. Well, here we go. Edward! Edward! Yes, miss? Is the car ready? Yes, Miss Virginia. I've been waiting for you. Let's go before Mother sees me. Your mother's been looking for you, miss. I hope you didn't tell her. No, Miss Virginia, I didn't. Good. Come on, Edward. Where do you wish to go, Miss Virginia? The Starlight Dance Hall on Grove and 2nd Street. The Starlight, miss? Yes, Edward, that's the place. I wouldn't go there and escort you, I were you, miss? It's one of the worst places in the city. It has a very bad reputation. The Starlight Dance Hall, Edward. Very good, miss. Very good. slowly around the low light of dance hall. A tall figure leaning against the pillar watches her intently as he idly smokes a cigarette. He doesn't seem to belong there. His clothes don't have the nattiness of a dance lover. Jenny pauses not far from him. Deliberately, he throws his cigarette on the floor, steps on it, and slowly walks over to her. Oh, hello. You're not with anyone, are you? Oh, no, I, I'm alone. I thought so. I've been watching you all the time. Have you? I haven't seen you dance yet. I don't know anyone here. How about dancing with me, then? All right. Come on, let's go out on the floor. Do you come here often? No. I never go to the same place twice. You don't? Why? I'm always looking for new faces. I'm restless. Do you find the faces you're looking for? Listen. Listen to that song. I like that. I like it very much. Yes, it, it is a nice song. You know, you remind me of someone I used to know. I'm trying to think who. I do? Yeah. You mind if we stop dancing and go over and get a drink? No, uh, let's go. Well, then let's get down for some air. We can come back in a few minutes. Come on. But 
We'll be back before the music starts. Oh, you're hurting my arm. Am I? I'm sorry. <sighs> Fresh air smells good, doesn't it? It's so dark here. Let's go back. You're not scared, are you? Oh, no, it's... It, it, Let's walk down this alley and back. Oh, please, please. No, you Let me go. Oh! Thanks. That's a lovely necklace, beautiful. Why, you're just a cheap Shut thing. up. All you wanted was my neck. So long, beautiful. Look out. What's the matter? Behind you, look. Holy... She's dead. A girl. Murdered. With a white rosebud in her hand. <laughs> Well, Jenny, happened again last night. Just like the other times. The girl strangled in an alley and a white rose in her hand. Any news of the killer? No. He might just as well float through the air for all the trace he leaves. He must have bought the flower upstairs in the dance hall. He must have been there earlier, bought it, and saved it. No, there was only one rose sold up there all night. And to a man who had a different girl with him. We had the flower girl. How did you know that they sold flowers there? I didn't tell you. Well, I... I must have read it somewhere. You couldn't have. It wasn't in any of the papers. No details were given, just the statement that an unidentified body was found. Well, I... Yeah, well, I just imagined that they'd sell flowers in a place like that. Well, I'm glad you don't go near those dance halls. Why, with this nut running around... Oh, don't bother about that. We'd better catch this killer. And fast. Where, where do you get this wee stuff? To hear you talk, you'd think that you were on the case, too. Wouldn't you think so? To hear me talk? Again, Jenny tours the low dives, hunting for the white rose killer. Her search carries her to the waterfront. And as she walks past each dingy bar, she listens to the jukebox music. A little after midnight, she passes a dirty windowed saloon. The thin music catches her ear. and listens, her eyes alive for some sign, some indication of the person she's looking for. Then suddenly her body becomes rigid as her eyes fall upon a figure huddled in the shadows. Someone's watching me. Slowly she starts to walk up the street. Behind her, the heavy tread of a man's footsteps keep pace with hers. It's a quiet tread, unhurried but deliberate. For several blocks, it keeps the exact distance. Jenny starts to walk faster. I've got to know if he's really following me. The man quickens his pace. Jenny starts across the street. The man follows. She's sure now, sure that the man is following her. She fumbles for something in her purse. Her hand closes around a gun. If he tries anything, I'll shoot. You in any trouble, lady? Oh, no, officer. It's, it's all right. You scared him away. Scared who away? Oh, just a man who wanted to bring me flowers. That's all. Well, he brought you one anyhow, lady. What do you mean? Right down on the ground, right by your feet. A white rose. <laughs> Coffee, Mabel. Sure, coming right up. Here you are. Jerry. Jerry. Hello, Jenny. Sit down. Thank you. Say, what's the matter with you? Look, darling, read the gossip column in this paper. What daughter of a socially prominent family sat way about a detective and waits for him outside the station house in her limousine every night. Private chauffeur and all... 
But Mama says no. That's not so funny. Oh, they held a big family war council over me just now. Indian powwow, feathered headdress and everything. They did, huh? Well, what did they decide? Oh, I was asked to give my word that I wouldn't see you anymore. I refused, of course, so I'm to be exiled. Where to? Our summer home. It's just a few hours out of town, but I'll be there all by myself. Just with Mrs. Crosby, the housekeeper. Oh, maybe they're right. Why don't you listen to them? Are you on their side, too? No. When are you leaving? Right away. Edward is driving me out. I just slipped out to let you know. Here's the address and phone number of the place in case you want to reach me. Don't lose it. I won't. Well, what's new and exciting about the white rose killer? Our famous lover of flowers? <laughs> We're still trying to track him down. I suppose I'll go looking for him at the flower show that's just opened. Oh, a flower show just opened? Yeah. Well, uh, goodbye now. I'll be seeing you. What uh, floor is the flower show, please? Third floor, miss. Three, please. Third floor. Where's the rose display, please? Uh, to your left, over there. See where the man in the gray coat is? In the gray coat? Oh, yes, thank you. They are lovely, aren't they? Oh, you, you startled me. I'm sorry. I was just admiring the roses. Oh, yes, the nicest flowers here. I, I just can't keep my eyes off them. Yes, you, you can feel that way about some flowers. And that's the way I feel about white roses. Have you been here long? I really don't know. I suppose so. You, you see, I've come here every day since the show opened. I like to be near the roses, the white roses. Those big ones are nice. No, I, I like the little ones best, the little tightly curled rosebud. They're so little and innocent. Oh, well, I, I really better be going. Are you going down? Yes. Down, please. Here, miss, I, I took a rose for you. Thank you. It, it's lovely. And would you, would you care to have a drink with me? Why, yes, thank you. I know of a little place a block or two down there. They have nice music. We'll go there. All right, whatever you say. <laughs> This is it. Where's the music? A nickel in the jukebox, does it? Any special song you'd like? No. Uh, go ahead and pick one. Okay. Uh, oh, that's my favorite song. It reminds me of a, a girl I used to know. Oh, uh, excuse me, I... Uh... I want to part of my nose. I'll be right back. Do you mind? No, of course not. Seven police precinct. Sergeant Thomas speaking. Hello, I is Terry Riley there? Uh, just a moment, I'll see. Please hurry, it's important. No, sorry, Miss Terry Riley's not here just now. Oh, uh, will you uh, will you tell him tell him that I can't keep that date with him? Goodbye. Do you always go to the phone booth when you want to powder your nose? Why, I I, uh, well, I I had to make a call. Uh huh. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to leave you. Oh, wait. Uh, let me come with you. I'm sorry, miss, but I've got other things to do. Oh. What's the matter? That car. Someone that knows me. Let's get away from here. That's just what I'm going to do. So long, lady. Wait, wait. Please don't go. Miss Virginia. Miss Virginia. I'm sorry, Miss Virginia, but I must speak to you for a minute. Oh, Edwards, what did you want? I'm sorry, miss. You'd better come with me at once. I've been looking for you everywhere. Your mother's been taken seriously ill. Mother? Where is she? She's out at the country, please, miss. 
I drove her there shortly before dinner. She wanted to pay you a surprise visit. Oh. I believe the shock of not finding you there upset the miss. Is she very bad? She had the doctor with her when I left. Mrs. Crosby has gone away for the day. Your mother needs you, miss. Well, let's go. Hurry, Edward, please. Right, miss. <laughs> Where is Mother Edwards? In the room, miss. You'd better hurry. Mother. Mother. It's Ginny. Is the doctor in there with you? Mother. Why, there's no one here. The room's empty. The bed hasn't been touched. <laughs> What are you doing? Merely playing a song, Miss. A favorite of mine. Uh, a favorite? Yes, Miss Virginia. Where's Mother? She's in the city, Miss. You lied to me. I'm afraid I did, Miss Virginia. Why are you locking the door? You know why, Miss Virginia. It, it can't be. You're not the... The white rose killer? But you see, I am, Miss Virginia. Driving you and your family around day after day. Sitting there right in front of you all the time. It was amusing to watch you hunting for me. Hunting for someone you saw several times a day. It can't be. You're not insane. Of course not. Who said I was? Edwards, you know I'm not the girl who betrayed you? Yes, I know that. Well, then unlock the door and let me out. Please, Edwards. I killed five times. I've never regretted it. I'm going to kill you, Miss Virginia. Why, Edwards? Why? Because you've been so clever. Too clever. You made yourself look like her, the girl who deceived me. I could have killed you the day you first went out looking for me, but I had to be careful. Oh. I almost caught you that night at the waterfront, the night I dropped the white rose when that police car came. Edward, I... Uh, I've never done you any harm. Your sweetheart, Terry. He loves you, doesn't he? Yes. That's good. Because now you won't be able to deceive him like my girl deceived me. Keep away, Edward. Keep away, or I'll... <laughs> you thought you'd use your gun, eh? Well, don't think I was fool enough to overlook that. I took your gun out of your purse. It won't do you any good to kill me, Edward. I didn't have anything to do with... No, <laughs> you're not going to have a chance to break another man's heart if she broke mine. Jenny! Jenny! Where are you? Jerry, Terry! It won't do you any good to call to him. He can't get in here without breaking down the door. Keep him away from me. Terry! It'll be too late then, because I'm going to kill you now. Jenny, where are you? Terry! Yes, let me get my hands on that pretty white throat. Keep him away. Keep him away from me. <laughs> Terry! <laughs> Jimmy, are you all right? Yes, Terry, I... I'm all right. Oh. Take it easy. Here. Sit down. Oh, Terry, I was so scared. There was nobody here but Edwards and I. How how did you know where I was? Oh, it was simple. You were supposed to meet me at the coffee shop. You never broke an appointment, and when you didn't show up, I called the number you gave me. You told me the housekeeper was here all the time. And when there was no answer, I got suspicious and came down. Besides, when I got a message down at headquarters that you had to break a date with me, I knew something was wrong. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I... I'm... Uh... Terry. Look. On the floor beside Edwards. A white rose. Must have fallen out of his pocket. That was meant for me. Oh, Terry, it, it's all crushed. Yeah. Crushed and dead. Just like the white rose killer. And so closes The White Rose Murders, starring Maureen O'Hara. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black. Well, listeners, I'm not sure if you can hear that. That's the rain. It's pouring down over here in Australia. I hope you enjoyed today's set of two murder twists. I just knew the lawyer was dodgy. 
And I have a listener that listens to this podcast, Star Eve 2099, who is as sharp as a tack when it comes to these tales, and I have a feeling they would have caught onto it straight away. So, I got to ask, when did you click that he was the one that murdered his partner? For me, it was when the lawyer swung in to save our protagonist on very little evidence, and with mounting evidence against him. Let me know what you thought though. And the twist killer at the end of White Rose Murderer, well, that took me much longer to get. Until the very end, actually. There were no telltale signs, unfortunately. None that I could find. But I really enjoyed the twist. That particular old-time radio episode needed the most work, by the way. was extremely difficult, deciphering the noise from the female voices, due to the high frequency ranges. So if you have any feedback on that one, let me know. Good, bad, your opinion counts, so don't shy away from providing it. I really do appreciate it. Mates, have a brilliant Monday. If it's packed with work, remember that it too will end, and you can slunk back at home in no time at all. And if you're chilling in bed right now, or about to go to sleep, enjoy the soft cushions and impending slumber. Rest well, you lovely listeners. And as always... Till next, we meet.